Hello, I'm Audrey Kurth Cronin, founding director of the Center of Security, Innovation and New Technology at American University. And I'm also a professor of international security at the School of International Service. Today, it's our honor to welcome Bruce Schneier, the world renowned computer security expert and famous cryptographer. Bruce is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, a board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Access Now, the TOR Project, and Se Chief Security Architect at Interrupt in Incorporated, among a number of other things. Bruce's reputation as a top cryptographer even earned him a mention in Dan Brown's mega-selling book, The Da Vinci Code. And Bruce is himself- I, I was a realistic background detail, that is true. But I thought it was cool. Right, the dashing young French cryptographer studied me in school. It was kind of weird. It's, it's, it, it was surreal, actually. But it's, it just shows your, the reach of your reputation. Bruce is also himself a New York- They show up on Google as, as a top hit when you type cryptographer, give me a name. I mean, but okay. <laughs> That's even better. All right, right? So you're also a best-selling author yourself of 14 different books, including Schneier on Security, Data and Goliath, Click Here to Kill Everybody, and a lot of my students read these books. So, but what I love best about your work, Bruce, is that you make very complicated concepts interesting and, and accessible to ordinary people. Ordinary people who really need to be thinking about their internet security in their daily lives. Uh, you're also pr phenomenally prolific. Uh, you have a blog, Schneier on Security, and a monthly cryptogram newsletter that's read by more than 250,000 people. I strongly recommend it to you, audience. I learn a lot from Schneier on security. It's funny. I started doing that new email newsletter when email newsletters were cool, and then they stopped being cool, and now Substack appears, and they're cool again. Cool again, yeah. Absolutely. So everything comes around, even on the internet. Yeah, right. Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> but the most important thing I want to mention is that Bruce is also an alumnus of American University. He received his master's in computer science in 1988. So Bruce, I did not realize you're one of us. I'm so excited. I was so excited to find that out. Right, because I was working at uh, the Naval Station at Brasca Avenue, diagonally across the circle. So I would be able to come to classes at the end of the day. So it was like the easiest institution for me to attend because I was right there. Well, we just want to take credit for you, Bruce. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. Brilliant re Renaissance man that you are. I'm just proud that you got a computer science degree at American University. And I also want to say thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me and to meet with us today. Um, we have an hour to let the audience know. Uh, Bruce teaches at noon our time, so uh, we're going to cut it off very sharply. Um, and so he and I will talk for a little while, and then we'll take some Q&A about halfway through, I guess. We'll see how it goes. So um, that's it for an intro. Uh, Bruce, I wanted to ask you about what everybody in this town has been so worried about and buzzing over, and which is, of course, solar winds. I wanted to start there. So, you know, what's your view of the solar winds hack? Can you give us a sense of the, the broader national security significance, but also, you know, how can we change the incentives for private companies like solar winds so they can prioritize reducing risks and, and not causing these kinds of vulnerabilities for all of us? Now, the second answer is going to be hard. No one's going to like the answer, but let's talk about the first first right solar winds also called starburst yeah, right solar winds was an initial attack vector and my guess is the company's going to change its name because now it's forever associated with a russian intelligence operation which is like not a good pr move yeah. for for your company <laughs> uh so solar winds is a, a a piece of network management software right, sorry, 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 solar winds is a company the software is called orion it's network management software uh it's boring it's infrastructure it's used in hundreds of thousands of companies worldwide. Companies didn't even realize they were using it until this happened. Uh, what the Russian SVR did is they were able to hack the company's update server. All right, so you all listening use Windows, you use Macintosh, you know that you get updates all the time. And we security professionals say you keep your uh, patches up to date. Always update your software. That is how you maintain security. That's the mechanism. Right? And that, that's a very broad mechanism. We don't know how to design secure software out of the box. So what we do is we rapidly patch when we find vulnerabilities. That is the way we maintain security. 
Uh, so the SVR basically subverted this exact mechanism. They were able to put a backdoor, a means of access, into a SolarWinds update uh, back in March, I believe. Uh, about 18,000 companies downloaded that update and dutifully patched their systems, thereby giving the SVR access to their networks. Now, if you are the SVR, you cannot hack 18,000 networks. That's just too many. You don't have the time. You don't have the people. So you prioritize. And we know that uh, the SVR used that access to penetrate uh, – a variety of networks inside the U.S. government, uh, corporations, other countries. We don't have a list of who was penetrated. You know, we have we we have we have examples. We have we have a list of companies that were we we do not know it's exhaustive. We're pretty sure it's not exhaustive. There might be a more exhaustive list in some classified room somewhere that I don't know about. Mm. All right. So so that and that was just an internal means of access. It turns out to be a very broad operation. Uh, it involved targeting uh, security software, malware bytes, and FireEye. It involved targeting uh, Microsoft 360, uh, their cloud service. Uh, and I've read that about one third of the companies uh, that were penetrated in this operation did not use SolarWinds. So, right, so SolarWinds becomes this access to to getting other accesses. So it's a very broad intelligence operation. Now. What you do when you hack a company, you know, you get access via SolarWinds or some other way, is the first thing you do is you move laterally, you establish alternate means of access, right? You, you embed yourself deep into the network. And you can embed yourself very deep into a network. Right? For example, uh, this is this old example. I think it's around 2012. This is a, uh, an NSA classified capability. Uh, it was first uh, published in the Snowden documents. It was stolen by the Russians in the uh, the shadow brokers when the NSA lost about their attack tools. Anyway, this is an ability to put malware onto a computer that survives reinstalling the operating system. Wow! Right. So, so this is almost a decade ago. Yeah. The NSA had this capability. Uh, the Russians stole this capability. This capability exists in public now. There's a, imagine a decade of advances in what we call persistence. Mm -hmm. So if you are the U.S. Treasury Department and you know the Russians are in your network due to solar winds, the only way to reestablish the security is to burn your network to the ground and build it up again, which honestly, you're not going to do. No one's going to do that. So we don't know what level of access the Russians have in what network. And we're gonna, it's going to be very hard for us to know when we've removed them. This is a major intelligence operation. It's a phenomenal piece of work. I mean, you know, we are all impressed at, at, at the magnitude of this operation. Now, it is the sort of thing the NSA will do as well, right? I mean, we do this to them. Next question. Of, co of course. But yeah. there are some differences. Okay. You know, the, the U.S. doesn't do those kind of broad spraying. If you look at what the Russians did, basically, I mean, they hack SolarWinds update – Every SolarWinds customer is potentially vulnerable. Yeah. U.S. is a lot more targeted than that. We do not do those kind of broad attacks against the supply chain. We are very good. I mean, we are probably the best, but we do not do that kind of uh, broad access. That, that's just too risky. But these are sorts of risks that governments like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea are willing to take. Whereas governments like the U.S., U.K., France, Germany, Israel I mean, are, are not. So there's a difference in style. So this is a, a major operation. Um, it was discovered. This is really important. It was not discovered by the U.S. government or any government. It was discovered by a private company. It was discovered by FireEye. You read about how they discovered it. It was kind of a, a series of suspicious events that no one said, you know, this is probably nothing and ignored it. They just dug a bit further. Mm -hmm. eventually found it and, and publicized it. You know, so I mean, why is it that this major attack against US, U.S. government has to be discovered by a private company kind of on their own nickel because they're, they're curious? Because basically they do it for the PR. So this is a big deal attack. We can talk more about it, but I think your other question is really important, how to prevent it. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about SolarWinds specifically, and then I'm going to talk about 
the ecosystem more generally. Solar Winds is a private equity funded company. It is owned primarily by a Brazilian billionaire. Uh, the equity company is uh, Tama Brava. Mm. And what Tama Brava, like most private equity companies are known for, is, is reducing costs to increase profits. They tend to buy companies uh, that are infrastructure, that are, are sticky, that customers are not likely to remove. And they, they basically squeeze all the costs on. They make the products mediocre. And they just, they just increase the profits to the shareholder. That's, that's your business model. Mm. So what we know that SolarWinds has done over the past two years is skimp on security. I mean, they actually have mediocre security. I did an, I did not bad in the New York Times where I listed a bunch of, uh, uh, of evidence of that. Mm-hmm. And, and the way to think of it is what SolarWinds did is they pushed risk onto their customers without their knowledge and consent in the pursuit of short-term profits. Yeah. Now, that is what the market economy demands. I mean, there are lots of companies do that, and it's not just private equity companies. Right? The market doesn't reward security. It's largely opaque. You as a customer, even a big corporate customer, have trouble judging the security of, of what you're buying. Mm-hmm. So companies are incented to basically do as lousy a job as they can get away with, right? because that maximizes profit. If you want to fix that, the way you fix it is through government regulation. This is how we ensure that the market doesn't have these externalities. Right? You know, you don't want uh, factories polluting the skies; you make it illegal. Now, you don't want uh, a company selling pajamas to for kids that catch on fire; you make it illegal. Yeah. Right? You don't want you know pharma- uh, pharmaceuticals that uh, that harm or poison; you make it illegal. Right? Regulation is how we establish the playing field on which the market operates. Right now, the playing field in the absence of regulation is as minimal security as you can get away with. Mm-hmm. Now, this turns out right now to have national security implications. Now, what I just described as the answer is one super unpopular. Yes. No company wants to be regulated. That's going to go next, Bruce. Yes. And two, it's not going to be cheap. Yeah. Right, you know, we like our software to be cheap. Designing software to be more secure, forcing companies like SolarWinds or Microsoft to have more security will make their stuff cost more, which means we have to pay it. Mm-hmm. And if we don't want to pay it, we have no option. I mean, if 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 you don't want to pay the increase in your airfare in order for planes to be inspected. And pilots to be certified, you don't get inspected planes, you don't get certified pilots. You just don't. But Bruce, and, and it's no difference here. People don't necessarily know that. It's not like there's a trade-off that people are aware of. It's not like they know transparently what their security is. I know that in addition to recommending regulations, you've also talked about minimal security for computers, that you know, minimal standard and liability laws. Right. But, but right. from what I understand, you're talking about liability laws for computer uh, for uh, producers as far as the degree of their security, not liability for the outcome of the breaches of that security. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, you could do either. So, so I'm not a policy person, right? I'm a security person. And what I see is the cost of insecurity is too cheap. I want, I want uh, Tama Brava to look at its portfolio of companies and say, wait a second, right? We are going to be more profitable if we have more security. Yeah. So in order to do that, I need, right, right now, insecurity is cheap, security is expensive. To make insecurity more expensive, right, uh, liability helps, right? If, if all the companies affected by solar winds could sue solar winds, right, mm-hmm. every other company says, wow, we don't want that liability, we're gonna do better. If there's standards, regulations, right, the government will fine us. The government will put our CEO in jail, right? All of that raises the cost of insecurity. So the exact mechanism will depend a lot on the details of exactly what we're doing mm-hmm. and, and how we want policy to work. But right now, right, the, the cost of solar winds insecurity was an externality for them. Right? They, re- they, they reap the benefit of, of, insecure, uh, of the cheapness of insecurity, but they don't pay the cost of the cheapness. The cost is paid by 
all the companies that were hacked. And that's the fundamental issue I need the government to solve. It is a collective action problem. Hmm. It is not a market problem. It is a market failure. Well, so, you know, being in Washington, we think about practical ways to make policy. I know you're not a policymaker, but, but you've got to have people who understand understand these things in that structure who are also in Congress, for example, because you're not going to have legislation for regulation unless you've got congressmen who are educated and understand it, or at least their staffs. I mean, don't we have a long way to go? Because you also have to have consumers educated and they may not be the ones who ultimately pay the cost, but they do in inevitably if it's an undermining of national security, right? I mean, we do, but I think we have a long way to go. Yeah. Because you're right. This, this, and this is not a, this, this is not a, this is not a campaign issue. You don't see this discussed oh at presidential gosh. debates, right? Yeah. Right. This is not an issue people care about. I think the first thing is you're right. It is. It is hard to understand. Yeah. It's not. It's not obvious. It's not. It's not the same as planes falling out of the sky. True. Right. Which 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 we would know, and a lot of us think that it's going to take some major you know loss of life that was to really make this a real issue, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? And, you know, because you know you think about Equifax, right? Yeah. 145 million Americans have their credit information stolen by China, including uh, or. Office personnel management, everybody with a security clearance as a personal information <laughs> stolen. Yes. Yeah, and we're all saying, well, this will be enough, right? Everybody yeah. in government has been affected by this, and it's yeah. not. Right? The, uh, you know, it's not the Russian attacks against the Ukrainian power grid shutting off power. Yeah. It's not this. Is it going to be you know, someone hacking cars at speed on the highway? God, I hope not. And, and will that be enough? I'm... There's a lot of areas in our society where we do regulate where people don't have the expertise. True. Right? And, and we do it because the effects are immediate. Our problem here is, I mean, even solar winds, you ask someone randomly on the street, didn't affect them at all. What do they care? Exactly. Equifax didn't affect them. So maybe it's going to take Internet of Things and, and something with physical agency. Now you mentioned my books. This is my this is my latest, the awesome title of Click Here to Kill Everybody. Yeah. And in it, I talk about the Internet of Things and security. And I do spend, I, I right, this is the amount of, of, of space I spent on, you know, what should be done. So it's a, I, it was considerable. Yes. And it's a lot of different things. But you're right, the political will isn't there. And the political will won't be there until Everybody, the people say, hey, something must be done because until it becomes an actual political issue, only lobbyists care and only they are in charge of, of writing the rules. And right now, it's the you know, small L libertarian, don't regulate me, free market wins. Yeah. That win. I mean, and you have companies like Facebook will basically, basically like drop democracy in the name of short-term profit. So we got a lot of serious market failures here, but no real will to go against them. And you're not gonna get that until it becomes a campaign issue. So would you agree that we have surveillance capitalism? I mean, that have you read that book by any chance? I, ha I have read the book and I, and I know Shoshana Zuboff, it's a great book, I don't have it in front of me. I have it on my shelves behind me. All right. Uh, and, and so it's a long book. I, I don't only recommend it for, uh, for people who really want to wade through it. But, but we certainly do. I mean, I mean you, you know we do because many of the services you get for free spy on you in exchange for you getting those services for free. So, so it's not really a question of whether they have surveillance capital. The question is how different in it is it and what, what are the ramifications of the differences? Uh, you know, yeah. I agree with uh, Shoshana that surveillance capitalism is a different animal. As, as evidenced by the, the way companies like Facebook and Google operate, uh, but also, and she, I don't think she doesn't uh, talk about this enough, one of the real problems we have is, the, is are the, that these are monopolists, that it's the same old monopolistic behavior. I mean, if we had 20, 30, 50 Facebooks, it would be a lot different because you'd see some of them competing in, in niches in different ways. So there is surveillance capitalism, and, and that is that is a, something we have to deal with, right? This unregulated uh, corporate spying uh, on everything we do. But also, you know, with the fact that we haven't enforced our monopoly laws since like the '80s is is a real problem, and and something we should do, or the EU should do, somebody should do. 
Okay, but so where do you start? So the way I come at it, of course, is that I study terrorism. And I've been looking at Facebook and a lot of the kinds of things that they allow to be on their platforms. And, and their answer is moder you know, moderation. I mean, it seems, feels like it's nibbling around the edges, you know, but, but, but you have to start somewhere. So, so even if we have a major disaster, I mean, we've had the major disasters in, in terrorism where you've got people, uh, you know, shooting up 54 people in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, and, the, and then posting it live on the, you know, on, on uh, various platforms. And, and, and it seems like very little has really happened. How do you get, you know, if, is it a car? If, if a car crashes because it's hacked, then they're going to fix the car. They're not going to fix the broader network. So I, I don't really, how do you start, Bruce? Right. I think you start with the car and work upwards. But it, 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 and you're right. The, we need to have the political will to go against these companies. And, and we don't. And, and some of it is that, you know, they're enormous uh, money faucets. Right. Governments like all the all all the the wealth these companies generate. The U.S. certainly does. Yeah. You know, going against it is hard, and 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 this is a perennial problem we have when the interests of companies go against the national interest. We're not good at dealing with that. We're not. We you know we, we like it. You know, what's good for GM is good for the country. I mean, that's the motto we we tend to like, which probably nobody on this call remembers except you and I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this notion that that right that, that that corporate behavior is by definition good for the country. Most of the time, that is true, right? Most of the time, the the market is a really good way to organize our society. But it, it doesn't work when the costs are externalized. And if the market externalizes all the costs of pollution. Then, then what you get is a lot of pollution because that, that's the way the system works. Yeah. If the market externalizes all the costs to democracy, to a discourse, to national security. So, so you need some way to internalize those costs. So you have to start by doing that. I, I agree we don't have a political will. I mean, it's not going to happen anytime soon. I, mean, I don't think there'll be any legislative changes due to solar winds. Right? There, we had hearings last week. Now you heard that the CEO of Solar Winds blamed one of their problems on a summer intern. That's kind of, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I throw the interns, throw the interns under the bus. That's easy. Oh, geez. So, right, but but you're you're senior people. <laughs> you're you're not going to see things done because because we're not we're not we're not ready to do that. And and the question is, what would it take? And I don't know the answer to that. Well, you I see, keep thinking this will be it, and I keep being wrong. We went through a similar period at the end of the nineteenth century. So you know, this is what I've been my book is about not to tout my book but but you should tout your book totally <laughs> wave it around i did power to the people right so we talk about it's behind me so <laughs> <laughs> i mean um you know one of the things that i look at is the spread of dynamite and the fact that that it was unregulated and so people kept blowing up and blowing each other up and and attacking leaders and you know it's the same sort of pattern the europeans began to have more regulation, they move toward regulation faster than the United States did. And what's really interesting is that um, in that case, at least in the United States, what happened was that a private organization, the, the railway association, a trade organization got tired of having their rail cars blow up. And so they began to put in place regulations so that they didn't lose their own property. And ultimately, you know, of course you had the- So, so they just refused to transport dynamite? So they just made it harder for it to get around the country? Yes, they refused unless, unless that dynamite actually met certain criteria. So you couldn't transport it across state lines. I mean, we had local, we had local laws, but they were never enforced. And you didn't have any kind of national policy at all. You didn't even have a federal detective service until 1908. So, you know, it was, it was completely free. And, and the number of dynamite attacks and, and large numbers of casualties that happened in the United States in the early 20th century exceeded everywhere else. Uh, so it, you have examples of a similar thing happening in computer security, you know, where you, without government, you know, some central part of the, the commercial network solves it. And yeah. the example I would point to is credit card fraud. Oh. Right? If you think about credit, credit cards, they are, they are the currency of the internet, right? Internet commerce wouldn't work without credit cards. Mm -hmm. And early years, there's a lot of fraud and the credit card companies are worried 
that people won't trust credit cards, won't use them on the internet, won't use them at all. And they enforce something that's called PCI. I forget what it stands for. But these are security standards they are forcing on the merchants and saying, look, if you're going to store credit cards, you have to have this level of security because you keep losing these credit cards. Right? It's an externality to you. The, cost, the, the credit card holders uh, pay the cost, but the entire ecosystem is being put at risk. So in some cases where you have a centralized part of the network that is being harmed, right? the, in your case, the railways, yeah. in this case, the credit card companies, they can sometimes impose regulation, which is not government regulation. Those are rare, but they're interesting when they happen. I didn't know about Dynamite. Is Dynamite uh, how a World One started? Uh, well, it's related. I mean, actually, it was the killing of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Right, but I guess it was it was it was it a dynamite killing? It, it must have been right because that's what people used back then. There was some dynamite involved, but he was actually shot. So it wasn't. You know, what happened was that the group was trying to use it and they they didn't use it effectively. Mm-hmm. But I I, I I I was in in uh, Croatia. And I I was at that intersection. There's a plaque. Cool. That's cool. Well. What I argue in the book is that, I mean, dynamite killed a lot of people and killed a lot of leaders. And so it helped to destabilize a number of different countries. In oh, wow. Europe. So, I mean, the whole the whole context of the outbreak of World War One is very complicated. So I'm not trying to make it one variable. <laughs> but the role of dynamite and the fact that everybody was, you know, losing the effectiveness of their governance in many of the autocratic states played a huge role in their insecurity and the fact that World War One, you know, actually happened. So so I would say yes, there is a connection between dynamite and World War One, but not directly in the assassination. All right. Yeah. And, and tech affects policy and politics in so many interesting ways. I'm, I'm, I'm always intrigued by that because we are a product of the tech of our time. Yeah. And, right. I mean just like we're seeing today, uh, you know, political discourse is being affected by the tech of today. And That's it's sort of interesting to watch that. And we and we never know how it'll turn out. We are terrible at predicting the social effects of our technologies, right? I mean, every, you, you can say, right, you invent cars and people drive faster, but you never predict the invention of the suburb. And you can predict that there'll be the internet and people will buy and sell things, but you'll never predict eBay. Hmm. And the, the, I mean, the, the social changes due to tech changes to me are always fascinating and, and wholly unpredictable. One of the reasons why science fiction tends to get the future so wrong, right? They, they predict tech changes, but they don't, they got successful at the social changes. Exactly. Yes. When I was trained as a graduate student, it was always the emphasis on the social context when you study history too. And that's not popular in the United States because I, I was studied in England, but um, like, you know, just, can I, can I go back to that point though, that you made about credit card fraud? Cause I'm, I'm grasping at straws here, Bruce. I'm trying to look for ways that is there any sort of private organization that could help make this huge problem a little bit, less huge i mean can you think of any other analogies or possibilities you know because here we have you know the tech monopolies yeah are 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 extremely powerful and you know they're not going to make changes that are that are anathema to them we don't really have the same sorts of uh consolidation points true right you know so right i think we need we need better security standards we just need to re- raise your over level security. We're living in a world where the security of the toy you bought for Christmas last year affects national security. You know, that's a kind of crazy world. Yeah. But here is this device being built offshore, super low profit margin, right? Ad hoc, you know, it's, it's not even the same as, you know, this device, which is really built by a dedicated team. When there's a vulnerability, that team will, will push out a patch. You'll get it within a day. Mm-hmm. Now, your home router, right, the way you update your home router is you throw it away and buy a new one. That's, true. Right, that's the mechanism. And this isn't good. But that's what, the market, that's what the market produces. So if we want that home router to be better, and we do for a whole lot of reasons, it has to be the same level of regulation that we put on pharmaceuticals and airplanes and cars. Now we hate that answer, <laughs> right? We hate it. We it's love really the hard. fact, yeah. right? But and also it, it makes things slower. But, but we recognize that, right, right? We recognize that speed is nice to have, but even in something like a COVID vaccine, 
we're going to demand some pretty serious testing and safety standards before we're going to let you stick that stuff in human beings. Yeah. And that's totally fair. Right? I mean, we want that. The, the effects of getting that wrong would be disastrous. And we know that. Right? So the FDA spends a lot of time and they did, a, I mean, they, and they did things as fast as they could. And we have a vaccine in like record time for our species. We have three vaccines now. I guess we're going to have like, I mean, if you count on the planet, there's the Russian one. There's, I mean, there, there might be a, there's just a noisy number of them. This is, this is incredible, the amount of work we did. But we, we do ensure that they are safe. And that, that raises the cost of that by a lot. But we accept it there because we, we get it viscerally what happens when you get it wrong. I mean, when you get the iPhone wrong, it's kind of theoretical for us still. Mm-hmm. Well, right? how, about, how about infrastructure? So, um, you know, that example of uh, the, the hack of the old smart plant, that water plant in uh, Florida, and mm-hmm. where they increased, uh, somebody got into their team view software and they increased the amount of lie by a hundred times. And I mean, that got a huge amount of attention. And yet, First of all, does that sort of thing happen all the time? Well, is, so she could, is well, that it, kind of disaster that's going to make people see the connection? I mean, if it hits us. So a huge amount of attention. I, I, uh, I challenge you to go outside, ask the first 10 people you meet whether they've heard of it, and the answer will be no. I okay. didn't get it. Got, it got, got basically no attention. Got, a, got, got a huge attention in England about it. They it got a huge attention in them. our world, right? In our world, it got a huge attention. Okay. Right? In the world of cybersecurity, in the world of infrastructure, in the world of of terrorism, in yeah. the world of public safety, but in the world, it got no attention. Mm-hmm. Now, lots of reasons for this, right? But you know, we can talk about. I mean, it. it, it, it Twenty-four hour news. Nothing gets that kind of attention. Nobody actually died. You know, yeah. we are terrible at being proactive. I mean, a lot of people in my field think it's going to take one of those being successful. I see. Right? You know, 10,000 people die. Then, it, then you're going to react like you did to the to terrorist acts of 9-11. You're going to overreact. But, but if it's a near miss, nobody cares about near misses. We, we don't do counterfactuals. Right? We don't do, you know, could have been, we got lucky. And we got lucky. Don't worry about it. Right? I have better things to do. So I don't know. I, you know and then you, what you said rightfully is if it was uh, an, a real attack, let's say the power grid goes down. I mean, it was in the paper earlier this week or last week. It seems like China hacked India's power grid and used that as leverage in an international dispute. I didn't know that. Now, okay. that's a big deal. Yeah, New York Times reported it. Okay. And, and that's a really big deal. But it's a big deal in the international relations community. Yeah. It's not going to be a big deal out in the world. So, right, we see these implications. We see what's coming. But until it's here, I don't think it becomes a, uh, a, a regular person issue because that's, that's, that's our nature. So now we're at this you know, really unfortunate conclusion that it's going to take – some kind of massive loss of life, uh, you know, a power hack, uh, automobile hack, airplane hack, right? You know, water safety, because now these devices are affecting life and property. Mm-hmm. You know, I live in I live in Minnesota. You uh, you uh, shut down my thermostat, and you can uh, destroy my pipes and and do some serious property damage. Well, we saw this in Texas. I was I was going to mention That's that. Right. You know, another big infrastructure crisis so and and it's very fragile so it would be relatively easy to do that kind of thing you know I, I, texas is particularly fragile because texas decided not to be part of part of the federal system because i mean and, and right same thing right following government regulations is expensive and the bad thing hasn't happened yet mm-hmm. so you know texans are like like all other human beings are terrible at being proactive but bruce you, I remember immediately after September 11th, how balanced you were. Everybody was, you know, just hair on fire. We were talking about this earlier and, and very alarmed. And one of the things that was wonderful about talking to you and listening to you then was that you had a calm approach to what the security response should be. But now, do you ever get accused of being overly alarmist? I mean, the title of your book is certainly alarmist. I, 
I'm not saying that you're that was wrong. to sell books on the shelf. To be fair, no. I mean, I deliberately made it on and right, and I kind of walked it back throughout the book. But yes, what you just said is that we all have to have you know we have to have tens of thousands of people die before anyone's going to respond. Is is there no hope for education? Is there no hope for mm-hmm. for getting out of the pandemic, perhaps, and having people pay attention to these things more? I'm, I I'd like to think so, but I've been disappointed again and again. I mean, I I don't I don't think this actually is alarmist. I think we're learning that as as people, we respond to what's in front of us. And we respond to the things that matter to us day to day. And people were not affected by that Florida water hack. Mm-hmm. People were not affected by solar winds, by Equifax, by any of the breaches. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, you know, it, it doesn't affect me in the same way that you know, I see a plane crash and I think, wow, that could have been me. I mean, I, I don't have that reaction. So, you know, it might, I mean, it could certainly be that, I mean, government does allocate resources for things that the average person doesn't understand. And that happens. Right? So, so, you know, we spend a lot of money, I don't know, combating counterfeiting. I'm going to make this up. Yeah. Right. Even though, I mean, I couldn't care less about counterfeiting, right? If I find a if I find a counterfeit hundred dollar bill in my wallet, the first thing I do is spend it. <laughs> right. Right. And if they're arrested, when they trace it to you. But, but, you know, but I, but, you know, not my fault. I got it. I didn't know. Right. Okay. Right? But, but you think about it, the motivation for anybody when they find a counterfeit bill in their pocket is to spend it, get it out of their wallet into somebody else's wallet. Let them take the fall to discover that it's counterfeit. But, but that's just sort of an example of how we are, reacting to things that affect us in a very personal way, right? Counterfeiting is a national problem, right? Money supply, faith in the currency, inflation. We can talk about all the reasons that are super theoretical to me, but government does know, understand them and, and deal with that. Mm-hmm. So maybe, you know, if this becomes a national security issue, if uh, U.S. Cyber Command, Department of Energy can convince Congress that this is a national security issue, that we need to allocate money, that we need to uh, you know, pass regulation that pisses off companies in order to you know, bolster national security. I think we got a shot. Feels doesn't feel likely, but maybe. But don't you feel that Cyber Command is more interested in minimizing the kind of that sort of a threat because that would reflect badly on them? Yeah. Yep. I think that's correct. We all, we all minimize threats that haven't happened yet. Mm. We have a question here. It's about the example of uh, that you were talking about Chinese um, targeting Indian power sector. And it's, you know, how can we judge the um, private companies and their incentives and disincentives? Are they on the, you know, the early, the, the cutting edge of early warning for cyber for our societies? Is that, is that a good thing or, you know? It, it, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So the, the, the questioner rightfully says that uh, it's a uh, it's recorded future that identified that Chinese are targeting India, yeah. solar uh, uh, fire ride, identified solar winds, uh, Kaspersky identifies lots of attacks. Symantec does. Private companies are doing this. And, and, and the reason is PR. Basically, this is how these these companies are security companies. They want uh, the, their buyers, big corporations to believe that they are knowledgeable and smart and, and are able to, to you know, work, do the good work for them. And one of the ways they do that is doing this kind of analysis, publishing their findings and getting in the news. So uh, those are their motivations. Uh, that's fine, right? The, the, it's a market motivation. They are doing good work, right? I mean, they are accurate, but their intentions are not the good of society. Their intentions are to, uh, you know, to, is, is the, the, the PR value. I mean, even Kaspersky, which is a, a Russian company, mm-hmm. you know, will uh, expose Russian operations. Now, now, are they doing that with the consent of the Russian government? Who knows? I, you know, I don't even want to speculate on that. But what they're trying to signal is, you can trust us. Look, we'll, you know, we'll even burn the country we are from. Right? And uh, so, so that's what these companies are doing. Uh, we, we do see a lot of government operations. Uh, U.S. operations have been exposed in this way. Uh, Chinese, Russian, Iranian I mean, country uh, operations all around the world. 
So, so you, w- this is good information, and uh, it is in largely very trustworthy. I mean, the uh, a- a- attribution is good. Some of these companies will not deliberately not attribute. Like they'll go everything up. They'll say give all the evidence, but never say dot dot dot. It was Russia. They they sort of let others make that conclusion because because I mean, for whatever political reason. Yeah. But it, this is a market mechanism. This is a PR market mechanism. It's interesting. Because you could expect governments to do this sort of thing. Governments very rarely do. U.S. is doing more of it. It'll often happen a couple of years later in the form of indictments. Right? So uh, uh, the Equifax hack, I think it was 2014. It was a couple of years later that the FBI indicts you know, Chinese military nationals for the attack. Yeah. You know, b- before then, we had no idea who did it. So there's an example of the U.S. government making a public attribution. But there's so much space between when something happens and when there's an attribution. That's one of the reasons why you can't get people interested in worrying about cybersecurity, I guess. Right, because we, we want things to happen right then. I mean, the fact that nobody knows who did that Russian water power water uh, treatment plant hack yeah. is interesting. I, that surprises me. I mean, my guess, it was a disgruntled employee, either current yeah. or former. That's what it felt like to me. And I would have expected an arrest by now because it's kind of a sloppy attack. But we haven't seen anything. Hmm. Interesting. There's a question about Kaspersky um, just before we leave that topic. Um, uh, yeah, I see the question. I mean, how much should we uh, pay attention to Kaspersky? Is it part of the Russian intelligence operation? The answer is we haven't. We don't know. Okay. Uh, Eugene Kaspersky, who is the head of Kaspersky, uh, was a former. Uh, he was worked for the Russian government, I think, in intelligence before then. Uh, we don't. We don't know what the connections are. I, th- I think it's right to be suspicious of Kaspersky and, and giving uh, the company access. You know, as an as a antivirus, anti-malware company, installing their software gives them pretty extraordinary access to your network. Yeah. And I could imagine saying, you know, I'm not uh, comfortable doing that. Mm-hmm. But the answer is we don't know. So what do you think about the security of our 5G network? Security of 5G network is terrible. <laughs> May, right? hey, and, and the, you have any good news, Bruce? <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, the joke I heard is that AT and T is too busy, too busy suing Qualcomm to develop any five G equipment. Problem we have is pretty much all five G hardware is made in China, right? And and, and the the thing we've been debating for the past about three four years is, well, right, can you trust it? Right? Yeah. And it's a very basic question. Say the same question as Kaspersky. Can you trust a product built? in a country whose government you don't trust. Now, were I the government of China, I'd be dropping back doors in 5G equipment. Of course I would. And if I was the US, I'd be doing the same thing. And I, so I'm less worried about espionage. So there's a story of the uh, African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa which a couple of years ago was discovered that it was basically sending a copy of everything. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, it was built with the help of the Chinese. Okay. Right? So Chinese are doing, are doing a lot more uh, foreign aid, Belt yes. Road Initiative. So they helped build the, this, this African Union headquarters, including the telecom. And what, what they learned like a couple of years later is that every night it was sending a copy of everything to Shanghai. Like kind of yikes. Now, that's something that you're going to notice. If the Chinese build 5G network equipment that every night sends a copy of everything back to China, we will notice that. We will see the network traffic. They will not get away, get away with that. Right? They will not, that, that, that doesn't happen. I worry more about degradation. Okay. It is surprisingly easy to put in a, a kill code, a, you know, degrade capability code, a increase your error rate code. And my worry is this equipment shows up in, uh, in networks in the United States and Europe and elsewhere. And now China has leverage on our communications, mm-hmm. which they can either choose to tell us, either publicly or privately, because that is its own, I mean, that's its own uh, power uh, display, or they just keep it dormant. Now, we don't really have an alternative. There isn't, there's not a domestic alternative. It's too late to build one. I mean, I've seen people say, Give up on 5G. Let's make sure 6G is secure. Uh, there's, a, uh, I think, a really good point. I'm blanking on her name, former DHS senior official. And she said that we need to learn to live in a dirty network. Yeah. 
I cannot, right? Can we build reliability and security on top of what is probably hacked 5G equipment? And I think we need to start figuring that out. But so, you know, and solving this is hard, right? Like, this is a US product, but it's not made in the US, right? Its chips aren't made in the US. Its programmers carry 100 different passports. Mm -hmm. So these sorts of supply chain attacks can happen everywhere. Now, you couldn't decide we're going to build a US only iPhone. It'll cost 10 times as much. No one will buy it. Right? We are deeply international in our industry. This is a very difficult problem. The Bloomberg News has written about in the past, about three weeks ago, about China hacking network motherboards that have appeared in big data centers like Dell, Apple, Google. Weird story. I mean, it, it's wow. an exquisitely sourced, long story, follow on of some stories in 2018 that how China is doing this. Mm -hmm. Everybody denies it. Apple denies it, Dell denies it, the US government denies it, the UK government denies it. Uh, you know, Bloomberg, this is Bloomberg. This isn't some fly by night news organization. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether the story is true or not. Right? I can't judge. I want someone else to verify this story. But so far, no one has. I mean, and that's, I mean, and I, I bring that up to show how bad it is. It's not just that things are hacked. We don't know if they are or not, and we can't tell. Wow, if you don't know, Bruce, that's that's alarming. Okay, let's uh, see what our questioners have to say here. We've got a couple of things. One wants you to talk to us a little more about Huawei. I mean, the Europeans have taken a different approach from us. Um, anything you uh, add about their growth in other countries, for example, in Mexico? So I, I don't know a lot. I, I don't follow the details of that okay. to, to, to that extent. I mean, there are a couple of European companies that make 5G equipment. It's not as good, it's not as cheap. And here, China is leveraging the fact that its separation, its corporation government, is not as stark as, as it is in, in other countries. No, right? China, China is subsidizing their infrastructure companies because they want to dominate. So it's part of national policy. And this is a, this is a tool that we kind of don't have in the U.S. I mean, we can't like write a big check to Boeing to defeat Airbus. We can't, right? We, we don't. We don't do that. We, right. we, we get we get uh, contracts. So, I mean, we it, have, okay. So we we we, we get we get sideways. Do some of it, but it is not yeah. the same as having sort of a national interest based industrial policy. True. Which is what a company like China can do. Yeah. And a lot of my DoD colleagues are very upset about that situation. You know, they want to have much more, at least integration with many of the big tech companies. But that's a different topic. Yeah. So, and also just as hard. Yeah. Yeah. So when is 6G likely to come come online? Or I think I think we get a G every decade or so. Is that right? So in, so in ten years, yeah. I think 4G was was you know 2010, and 3G was 2000. So I think it's 5G's decade, and then it's 6G. So I, I think it's about and you know they might go faster because Moore's law, everything goes faster. But but yeah. it's generally about generally about one network upgrade uh, a decade. And and you know. The, well, the reason 5G is important, I think it's important for every people to understand, 5G is not designed for you to watch Netflix faster. Right? 5G is designed for things talking to other things. It's designed for the Internet of Things. It's designed for the sensors in your car to talk to the road signs. It's designed for the sensors in the, uh, in the street lights to talk to the city. Right? It's all of the things that will have embedded computers and embedded networking. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. And that's why... It, it, it's so dangerous that it's no longer screens that we interact with. It's objects in our environment that affect our environment. And we're not even in the in, involved. I mean, no, we're not. We're not in the loop. I mean, right. The, things talking about things behind our back. That's basically 5G. Yeah. But we want that because they're going to say things that are good. Right? We want our thermostat to talk to the power grid. Right. We want our fridge to talk to our thermostat, you know, and they're all going to negotiate, right? You know, how to reduce load, how to use power when it's cheap. I mean, this, this is actually really good for society, but it's also dangerous. Okay. Well, there's a question here going back to solar winds about that trade-off between opportunity and risk and benefit and, and risk. Um, so he says that 
there's broad exposure by the SBR. You can see the question, Bruce. How should we how should we handle that trade off when it comes to the security question we were dealing with before? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, the, the, the real difference is now these have national security implications. I mean, it used to be if your computer was insecure, I couldn't care less. <laughs> right? If a bank was insecure, it's their problem. Now all these things bleed into each other. Right? The security of your home computer affects this national security of the internet. I mean, it does. So, so right, things are just so interconnected. And, and that connection is through, through bots. Yeah. I mean, you know, if your home computer is insecure, it'll be recruited into a botnet, which can be used to take down the power grid. Well, yeah, right? that's bad, and that's mm -hmm. and, and and to you, that's an externality. But you know, we in society now have an interest in your computer being more secure. Where it used to be, I didn't care. Right, and and that's the difference. And I think that's how we have to think about the trade off. The trade offs are no longer individual. The trade offs are now societal. And this is where I start pointing to societal tools, right? The tools of individual trade-offs is the market. The tools of societal trade-offs is government. Government is how we act collectively as citizens and not individually as consumers. Now, you know, the, you give this talk to a, to a you know, libertarian audience and they don't want to hear it. I know. But, you know, we, we, this is the reality. And we've, we've gone past the point of, Government regulation, no government regulation. We're now still dealing with smart government regulation or stupid government regulation. Because something happens, we're going to react. Yeah. Okay. Well, I still have to believe optimistically that we can build some smart regulation. I mean, otherwise, I think I think we can. Okay. I, I, I you know, it's going to be painful. You know, right? But what was we say about the U.S. that we'll do the right thing after all other avenues have been exhausted? But we eventually but, do the right thing. But 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 the but the secret is to have great solutions in the hopper, you know, available ideas from you, from you know, from me, from all all the people who care about this, who are that are that are developed, so that when people just reach for a policy solution, it's not something right. stupid and underdeveloped. So that's why education and, and what you're doing is so important, Bruce. I mean, I, I I'm an optimist. I can't just believe that this is all useless. I mean, I, I really do think that that having great answers is going to be important. Yeah. And I don't think it's useless either. I mean, I, I actually do share your optimism. I mean, I do sound pessimistic, but I'm actually, I'm actually short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic. Good. Can you explain that? That I, I think we're going to get it badly. We keep getting it badly wrong in the short term, yeah. but in the long term, we're going to figure it out and, we, and we're going to have the secure, reliable systems that we will actually, you know, adopt a defense dominant strategy that we will regulate the industries need regulating that we will you know do the do the smart thing it'll just take us a while well i hope we still have a healthy democracy by the time we get to your long term um, i'm optimistic about that too but we'll see how it goes okay all right let's see uh is there a role for smart industrial policy over semiconductors to help secure supply chains i i, I mean so the answer is yes of course because supply chain is the entire chain mm -hmm. and so the solar winds attack is a supply chain attack right it's attacking the update mechanism Mm -hmm. And this uh, this Bloomberg story, if it's real, is 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 a supply chain. It's attacking the motherboards. Uh, we've seen attacks against chips. I mean, you can you can hack this iPhone through a malicious replacement screen. I mean, so so the I mean the things, our supply chains are very complicated, and pretty much all aspects have vulnerabilities. Now, even this, the shipping mechanism. You know, people people here might not remember. There was uh, an NSA document in the Snowden Archive of NSA employees intercepting, it's a photograph, it's a document in a photograph, a Cisco router destined for the Syrian telephone company. And it's a picture of them opening it up because they're going to put a back door in and send it on its way. Right? That is a supply chain attack. Mm -hmm. Remember, we talk about the difference between the US and Russia? That's what we'll do. We'll take a particular router, going to the Syrian telephone company, and, and hack that. Whereas Russia, let's hack all the routers, see what happens. So that's that kind of difference. So yes, there's there's role for for industrial policy on semiconductors and everything else, because it you know it's one supply chain and any link, if you subvert it, you, you subvert the chain. Okay, I I want to go back for just a second about your Bloomberg story because you just brought it up again and it and it reminded me of a question I have. I mean, if if there is the capability of hacking into all of those databases. That has enormous implications for machine learning, for artificial intelligence, for, for power, what power is. I mean, 
let's just stipulate for the moment that it's true. How do you play out what, what the implications are? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think the implications for AI, I mean, the whole notion that China has better AI because they're spying on the people more, I think is largely nonsense. It's not about more data. It's about the right kind of data and better data. But I think what's going on is countries like China are, are trying to exert dominance over the next decade and, and getting into infrastructure is a way to do that. So whether, I mean, you know, if you are in India's power grid, you can say to them, you know, stand down or the lights go out in Mumbai, right? That's a big deal. Suddenly that's a, that's a different negotiation than you'd have otherwise. Now it's escalatory, but I, I think countries are looking at that and, and a country like China, because they're embedded in so much infrastructure anyway, yeah. they're looking at ways to leverage that. Why wouldn't they? Okay, so you've already convinced me that we have no true defense against that since so much of our supply chain is- You know, the, the only hope right now is that we are embedded in their supply chains just- That was my next question. Right, so, right. You know, so, so we, read, we read lots of articles about Russia hacking the US power grid, right? Yeah. Lot, I see articles over the past few years. Yeah. The hope is that we are in their power grid just as much that we can send them a back channel message saying, hey, you know, don't do anything because it's because you're going to feel it just as badly, right? It's right now it's offense versus offense. Yeah, I think I think that's more dangerous. It's more escalatory, but that's what we have. Okay, so tease that out. How is it more escalatory? You think there's a direct connection to kinetic force? I think yeah, I, I think it can bleed into kinetic force, but it's also more risky. Well, because if it's if it's offense versus offense, it's me daring you to use your offense capability. I'm going to respond back with offense, which means you can have to respond back. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it was defensive, we can go to Russia and say, yeah, you, you know you think you're in our power grid, but honestly, you're in the fake power grid and we got you covered. It's just not going to work. I mean, go try something tomorrow. You'll see it'll have no effect. Nah, nah. Right? That <laughs> is a very different message than you know, we're going to hurt you just as badly. It's almost – I mean in this one dimension, it's almost like earlier nuclear weapons policy. It is, and, and there are good parallels between nuclear policy and cyber. There are, so there are ways it breaks down pretty quickly, but yeah. there are some good – and there are people, not me, who study really international relations of this, yeah. and, and their stuff's really worth reading. I always learn a lot, but it's not my area. Yeah, and I think those analogies are, are a little bit overdone sometimes. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, so let me ask you the last question I'm curious about. So let's pretend like you have – President Biden's ear, and that you're going to be able to make sure that he and his team do one specific thing. What would that be? And, and it's going to be a general thing because I think he needs to. We need to frame this as a national security issue. Okay. That when it's an issue of of consumer choice, when it's an issue of of companies and and free market, we get nowhere. Mm -hmm. This has to be a national security issue. You know, even to the even down to the level of the toys you're going to buy for Christmas, it is a national security issue. We're going to do these things for national security. And national security is something people get behind; True. they understand it, especially Americans. Right. Yeah. And so I think that would that's that's likely to make a difference. Right? We have point solutions will solve point problems, but if you want to move, really move the issue, it's a national security issue. That would resonate with Congress too. That's really interesting. So, I mean, you do touch upon that in your um, click here to kill everybody, but maybe you need to write another book now, Bruce. Uh, maybe, but I, I always take some years between books. <laughs> okay. Writing a book's hard. You know, you know that. You've written books. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm getting started on my next one, and uh, it is hard. Absolutely. All right, well, we are just about out of time and we can't get to any of the remaining questions. Thank you very much, audience, for asking good questions. Thank you, Bruce. I know that you're very highly in demand and I appreciate the value of your time and um, particularly that you've come back to your alma mater and uh, chosen to spend an hour with us here at American University. Uh, I'm, I'm just such an enthusiast of your work Please keep up the good work because we need this kind of education. And I really do believe that you're having a, an impact, a big impact. So, um, you know, go for it and, and keep up the great work. And uh, I wish you well. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great fun. I enjoyed it too. Bye Take all. Care.